Hi, I'm Yudh Dashota, along with my co-host Ishita Kayak, would like to extend a heartiest welcome to all the esteemed guests and faculties present here on the HR panel of Sapiens 2022, the annual management conclave of Great Lakes Institute of Management, Gurgaon. As we move into the post-pandemic era, trying to deliver upon the promise of creating an inclusive society for all, one which fosters friendship and promotes economic equality. It is important that we learn from our past mistakes and consider the environment in every step that we take. Economic growth helps us gain societal prominence and improves the quality of lifestyle. But is it sustainable? Human development can happen only when all three factors environment, economy, and ethics are taken care of. To meet the requirements of the present without sacrificing those of the future generations, we have to implement a sustainable growth strategy. Keeping this in our mind, Sapiens this year will focus on creating an intellectual environment which will aim to promote an ethical way of achieving sustainable growth. Most of the things that are being talked about are going to happen with the help of businesses where employment comes from. The role of HR in creating an environment where all the employees feel safe about the future while meeting their current aspirations will form a crucial part of this panel discussion. HR will be the major driver of the next sustainable growth program as it was when the world was trying to adapt to hybrid models of the workplace. The, the panel will also talk at length about why creating a workplace promoting discussion on sustainable development has become important and how it's no longer only about achieving economic growth, but achieving sustainable growth as well. Before we begin the panel discussion, I would like to request Dr. Purnima Gupta, Professor of OBMHR at Great Lakes Institute of Management, Gurgaon, to kindly welcome our panelists for the day. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to introduce our first speaker for the day, Mr. Alvin David. He is currently working as a general manager in HR with Nugent Software Technologies Limited. He has more than 30 years of rich and exhaustive corporate experience. He has done his master's in psychology in industrial and organizational behavior from Delhi University and has done his executive education program in advanced human resource management from Institute, Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. He represents a professional who is approachable a good listener, and an expert in strategically resolving the concern of the employees. I would now introduce Ms. Neeti Kumar, our next speaker for the day. She is an alumni of Exilar Jamshedpur and is an experienced leader with significant HR managing capabilities. She is also a practitioner and certified coach of Raja Yoga and has a track record in the insurance and IT industry. Apart from that, she is skilled in coaching, analytical skills, compensation, leadership, recruiting, training, and organizational development. Now, I would like to introduce our next speaker for the day, Ms. Vinita Kukriti, who is awarded by the 2022 Global Choice Award as the Women Icon of the Year, a strategic and innovative HR leader with 20 years of multi-industry experience in HR leadership and consulting. She has worked in organizations like the Boston Consulting Group, Publicis Sapient, and is currently the Senior Director HR at Pfizer. She has done her Executive Leadership Development Program from ISP and has expertise in translating business vision by designing and implementing innovative HR strategies and OD interventions to suit the needs of the organization in different growth phases. Now I would request Purnima Ma'am to start the discussion. Thank you. 
Thank you, Anilu and Nishita. Welcome to all the panelists. So, as uh, Akhi says, that we are into sustainability, and uh, we want to just understand about your organizations and how you are dealing with sustainability. And, uh, do you think it's important? And uh, how organizations are going about sensitizing employees on the same? So, maybe start with you, sir. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here in such an esteemed lead of ladies. Uh, it's my pleasure. This is my second year of Sapiens 2022. I was there in 18 or 19. I think uh, the topic of sustainability is very, very relevant, uh, specifically talking of today's time and age. And uh, if I talk of an Indian setup, what really hit us in 2020, I'm talking of COVID, no matter how much I try not to talk about it in any panel, it becomes the top of a town. So COVID has introduced, you all know how much digitally savvy that we have become. The organizations who were on paper and pencil were also moved on to this. A lot of our hiring practices have now all become digital. And the kind of things that we were not even imagining before the lockdown happened in terms of workplaces, that you can work from anywhere, remote work has got introduced. So I think sustainability was a talk of a town and that's how we really got organized. So it's a pretty organic as far as the Indian setup is concerned, uh, talking of the organization that I come from. And we have in the last two years have progressed so much in this area. Talking of sustainability, there are a lot of aspects that we're awakening to at this point in time as far as we at Indian uh, system setup is concerned. It's good to talk about, uh, but I know that a lot of you, uh, whenever I've revisited campuses, there is a mention of you getting associated with either one of the NGOs or feeling for one of the social causes. And it's a generation like you all and the ones that are coming into the ecosystem sooner or later, we are the ones who are really pushing the sustainability agendas to the agendas of the corporate. To the core of it, it still remains the employees at sustainability. If I talk of organization that I come from, we have been talking about employee well-being. We've been trying to really decentralize HR and ensuring that HR spokes will be the one who will be speaking and you know ensuring one-to-one -one connect, personal touch with all of them. But now we are introducing a whole new program around the entire employee well-being, wherein we're talking about the emotional aspect of it. We are talking about the physiological or the physical aspect of well-being and even the financial <coughs> well-being part. What I'm referring to, first and foremost, we need to have a sustainable employees to do because the kind of challenges that this hybrid work is throwing at us in terms of we as employees are also struggling in terms of you know maintaining our well-being as such. Then the other aspects in terms of how are we responding to the challenges, all of us are aware of the ecological challenges that we see around us at this point in time. I was just talking to the fellow panelists that my daughter who's in class seven, in last, before the COVID started happening, they, at their level, they were standing up for a cause like save Arabis. And I'm sure when these people will start feeling, they feel a lot about ecology and a lot about the issues like this that really surrounds them. So when it comes to attracting talent sooner or later, it will become a big EVP point for an organization to have. But at this point in time, I'll say it is very much needed and there's a lot happening around that, but we're still at a very nascent stage and it's a whole new paradigm that we'll be soon moving to. I think that's my take to start with. We are basically looking at the Bharat part of India. 
on how we can uh, really make that part progress. And that's a part of sustainable development of the country. The other thing, uh, when we look at sustainability, is how sustainable your organization is. And I think that's where the focus of the organization is very important. And in every pulse that we conduct, uh, there is such a strong sense of purpose and vision in our organization, not just in leaders, but in the employees. That the motivation comes of its own. You can come to our organization anytime, and you can see the kind of energy with which people work. Uh, you know, we celebrate Independence Day, we celebrate Happy Day, we celebrate all Bharat festivals, and we feel like we are contributing to the growth of the country. At a um, organization level, I think EdgeTech is a very nascent industry to be in which basically means that uh, it's a very dynamic industry. Things keep moving so much, and you would have heard of um, organizations such as uh, Baijus and Army Academy, who have like, spent so much on marketing and <coughs> branding. But for us, you know, you'd be surprised to know that the company has grown so far without any branding, without any sales. It's only now that we'll be hitting Ashtag and other uh, televisions uh, with our commercials and all that. So uh, for us, what it means is that you focus on your purpose. You grow and everything else comes later. And yes, like you said, that uh, for an employee, what it means is that you need to be uh, you know, well inside. And I would say, uh, being a leadership coach from ICF and a Rajyoga meditation practitioner, I would say, you know, everything is reactive. The first thing which you should really do to take, your, take care of yourself is to meditate. I can personally vouch for it that out of all the skills I have, the maximum strength which I get is from meditation. We have Professor Palman, he is my other side. He is our informal coach on meditation. He practices a lot and he's, been, he's an operations man, but he has been promoting the meditation and yoga in the institute and uh, we do hope to inculcate that in our students. So, yes, Vinita, your thoughts on sustainability? Absolutely, and it's it's a true pleasure to be here in front of all of you, you know, and uh, the three of us just hope that what we share with you brings in some learning and uh, sustainable you know, practices where you go forward. Uh, so before I really talk about what uh, key organizations are doing, I'd like to just take a step back and let's say since the last two years, really look at how the overall economy has changed, how the planet has changed and how the people's needs have changed, right? So the last two years has been pandemic and we all know how the organizations have worked in a completely different setup. So this has really compelled a huge focus on organizations to reinvent themselves. And when I say reinvent, it pretty much means that the way we started to operate, which is the example that we just saw, right, digitizing. So almost overnight, organizations went into a digital format. Similarly, if you look at the product line or the service line that you know organizations were getting into, they had to modify or change that. So a lot of physical connect or physical business was converted into a digital business. Similarly, the products, for example, if you just look at FinTech, right, because I represent FinTech, if you just look at FinTech, the online transactions really went to a great high, right, and the conversion of that became a prime focus. Whereas, let's say the cart spend or, you know, over-the-counter spend became almost next to negligible, right, and that's the shift in the business model that went through. And because the overall economy went through a shift and the business models went through a shift, it was obviously natural for organizations to reinvent their people practices. And therefore, multiple organizations like ours also took a pause to see what is it that we really want to become in the future. And when you really did look at it, it came out as sustainability. Right? So if you just look at 10 years back, right, so like most of us have close to about 15, 20 years of experience. If you look at 10 years back, the way for HR was strategic human resource management, right? We wanted to move from operational human resource to strategic human resource where we felt that 
you know what, you really need to see an outside in perspective. You really need to see it, see things from a consultative angle. However, today, because of everything that's really evolved, we have shifted further to sustainable human resource practices. And we've also shifted towards networking of human resources. Right? And that's exactly what you see happening right here. Right? So that's a little bit about how the overall environment has shifted. And when it comes to what organizations are doing for sustainability, I will just call out, you know, from a profit perspective, they're looking at how exactly from an organizational business model conversion, we can sustain our existence and possibly either move into a different line of business offering or for that matter, make our existing business line a little more relevant so that the life cycle of the business of the organization is extended. So that's as far as profit is concerned. Similarly, if you look at people sustainability and going back to business sustainability, because the business models have changed, the type of people that you require in the organizations have also changed. It pretty much means the skills that we needed have shifted. So we need to have a self-sustaining you know, system that produces those skills internally because there's a war for talent out there, right? So that's that's one thing that you know we're looking at internal sustainability of talent to meet the business sustainability objectives of the future, which are still agile to a large extent, right? And ultimately, if you just look at the planet, you know there is a huge level of because of the talent, right? Which is the war for talent. We do want to create a niche in terms of our employer branding, where we do believe that you know should we attract the employable segment of what's relevant for the organization will have to build in sustainable practices so that people relate to it people feel proud and you know at the end of the day they want to contribute to nation building you know they want to contribute to uplifting the society they want to contribute to really impacting India's per capita income, right? For that matter, they want to feel proud of what they've created. And therefore, engineering, innovation, are tools to build that sustainable environment, right? So that's, that's the thought that I would like to start on with. That brings us to the next uh, question that I would like to pull the panelists is, now, do you think that these systems, what kind of sustainable practices which are required to build that employee satisfaction? If uh, we have these kind of practices, does it uh, uh, go or does it build the satisfaction within employees or do they think that they're just doing it for the sake of, okay, I'm a part of the organization and if I must do it. But does it fill that sense of uh, belongingness as Nidhi said, you can take this first that, uh, as you said, that uh, your organization has people who are highly motivated and energized. So what is it that you do to make them do that? I think, um, you know, it's a sense of working for a country. And that's quite high. And uh, we don't need to explain it to everyone. You know, the company has seen its uh, growth path. Uh, there were times, like, I mean, in 2016, we started as an online brand. And at that point of time, we were pretty small. Uh, and they were, you know, like by Jews and other academies and all. They grew and they got a lot of funding. Uh, so uh, for us, it was difficult to survive at that point of time because, you know, uh, any good faculty we had uh, was easily poached. So uh, what that meant for us was that if you really want to grow as a company and grow on your uh, fundamentals, because we are not uh, direct competition to a YGs or an academy because they are very high ticket size. We are there for tier 2, tier 3 cities of the country. So how do you really survive that vision without getting acquired, with, you know, refusing all the proposals of acquisition and all because you have that uh, mission in your mind that you really want to make a difference as a company. So that's where the culture really comes uh, in hand. Because there were people, you know, I mean, there were some funny times, uh, scary times at that time, now I can call it as a funny time, when uh, the entire frequency from our group was poached. And the next day you didn't know what to do. 
So, uh, and how do you kind of manage such a scenario? And like from the beginning, we've been very people focused. And all those, you know, faculty who left us at one point of time are coming back to join us because they know that the culture of the company is very positive. So, I would say that uh, it is. Uh, you know, it is the reason why it is why It is the reason that uh, you know we've got. We are now funded by Westbridge Partners, InfoEdge, and we are now going to be funded by uh, one of the biggest IT companies in the world, and we will probably be the only tech company in the country which will be funded by them. So, uh, so it's it's because of these uh, you know values with which we have grown so far. Absolutely. So I'd like to say that, uh, you know, care is currency nowadays. So if you really go ahead and care for your employees, it's almost like paying them a certain amount of remuneration. Right? And that, during the pandemic and obviously after it, has had a huge amount of resetting the organizational culture. Right? Because I'm just going back to what I said earlier, because of the pandemic, right, and the world is never going to be the same again, because of the pandemic, the business models have shifted, the employee expectation has shifted, and the overall landscape of the environment has shifted in which the organizations are operating. And therefore, the way organizations are demonstrating you know, their care or their level of uh, employee value proposition has also shifted. So if we really talk about care, you know, what exactly is care? So care is all about the hybrid work environment that we are currently operating in, right? So if you really go back to the last associate and think from that associate's perspective, right? And the person's parents are in Jabalpur and then, you know, you have pandemic at the peak. Do you expect that person to be in office? Or do you expect that person to be next to his or her parents and taking care of them, right? So that's the level of understanding that an organization needs to go at. And multiple organizations have gone through multiple studies to understand the psychology of, you know, how organizations should really transform their overall culture, right? So we do have a psychology expert here sitting amongst us, and you know, we'll have a little more to hear on that. So care is the first one, right? So one is appreciating what your employees need. Second is demonstrating, right? And demonstration has to be in terms of what you say, in terms of what you practice, and in terms of what you offer to the associate in terms of their remuneration, right? So the insurance coverage is moving high, right? For that matter, Air ambulance getting into the insurance coverage, right? A lot of robotics and other advanced aspects getting into the standard offerings of, like, you know, the day to day insurances that get covered, right? So, this is one aspect. Second is, should you, God forbid, lose an associate because of any reason? You know, the organizations have gone ahead and upped the level of, uh, you know, coverage in terms of the death coverage, right? And then obviously, in terms of CSR, there has also been an extension. So should you go through hardship, right? So a lot of organizations looked at, you know what, at the end of the day during the pandemic, there were these injections that had to be bought at three times the cost. But our associates didn't have that salary, right? And how do you produce a certificate that I'm buying an injection in neck? Right? And therefore, there was a lot of uh, CSR driven aspect where the top leaders contributed 1% of their yearly compensation to create a corpus and out of that corpus basis application you know funding or support was extended now that's demonstration of care right so aspects like this is certainly one aspect of like you know building that environment of care second is because your overall organization has gone through a rapid change from a business model perspective you had to really focus as an organization on building an innovation culture, building an engineering culture, where you are also ensuring that people try, they fail fast, and in certain cases, failure is also celebrated. Right. So I think that overall environment was something really important, where I'm again going to go back to what I said earlier, where network of associations and network of relationships came into being. 
and therefore that came into the forefront. And ultimately the third one, right, because business models have shifted and they've evolved. And employee life cycle, you know, is going to outgrow a business life cycle. So if I have 20 years of career and if I stayed in one organization, my organization would have gone through multiple shifts and changes in their value proposition in terms of their stakeholder and shareholder value offerings. Right? And therefore, as an organization, we need to ensure that we continue to up our internal pool of talent because context is key. While skill is also reasonably important, but you know, any the most complex of skills can be trained. But as far as the organizational context and history is concerned and its relevance and association to the overall organizational purpose and move forward, I think that something through communication, the organizations are hugely focused. It could be CIO level interventions to talk about, hey, this is our bottom line, this is where we want to go, this is how we are looking at the financials, you know, we're looking at margins going up, cash conversion ratios becoming better. But at the same time, not losing the focus that all of this is getting done through people. And till the time we don't sustain the talent within the organization, your journey to the next level of what the organization has to offer is only going to get stalled or going to go slow. Right? So I'm just going to like take a pause and pass it on. So it's actually a nice, uh, and I think generation like you have, we have a lot to owe to considering. Uh, talking of 10 years back, I do remember when we started talking about there was a lot of researches that was coming from the Western world to the Indian side also. Well, the topmost <laughs> thing that employees are looking for an organization that they work for, do they have a respect for an individual? You know, we're talking of employee satisfaction as Professor Purnipa wants us to link these two. And that's where we started, you know, thinking of that respect and work. Will they go, do they go really go hand in hand? in our kind of setup, but I think that has changed significantly. I did hear a gentleman talking about, you know, just head up. I think I found that tone to be harsh. We won't be able to talk to our folks at this point in time and they'll be using that kind of tone. So we are so sensitive to treating people equally. Uh, the trends like no sir, no ma'am culture has picked up across Indian setup also. And we really mean that in terms of we're trying to create more of a flat structure wherein each individual is treated for the value that they bring into the organization. And rather in our organization, our promoter, Mr. Devaka Nigam, really hate the word fresher. By no stretch of imagination, you guys are fresher. Why organizations are, you know, gearing up to have people like you on their board because they want to have the fresh of the ideas. Because probably otherwise people within the organization have started thinking within the box. It is you guys who will start thinking outside the box. So we are really looking up to the campuses to bring in that kind of talent. And I feel that, you know, now the workplace is a very equal and a very flat workplace to work for. And that's what, ma'am, to your question, is really attracting the employees. And that really works. To the, the point that she makes purpose have suddenly taken a whole new level why organization exists. You know, and what is really sold well across the campuses and in the prospective employer. So it's really do, what is the purpose of the organization? A lot of you are very interested in terms of why does this organization attract? Tata till date really attract a lot of people and the Tatas are known for you know creating that kind of value. And you know, given a chance, I would love to work for them because the kind of value that they would like, the kind of purpose that they have. You know, and the epitome of that is Ratan Tata himself. You know, that really draws people. So these things are not really is in the within the rooms of our moral classes. They are now the real buzzword in campuses and corporates. So does sustainability, do I have something that I can offer you to sustain and promote the talent and the potential that you have? then the individuals get excited to work. So yes, it is sooner or later gearing up to even attracting the talent to the organization when you talk of practices like sustainability. A lot of you have started talking about in the first week of their job in terms of what about work-life balance. And we, we have a question to them, do you really know what does that mean in the first week of you? But those things are real questions that all of you have in your mind. You really want to create boundaries between your personal life and work-life balance. Some of us will still question that, is there any balance there? 
So I think the point is that in terms of, yes, it's very much a need of an R, and it's generations like you who's pushing the envelope much more, and organizations who are really started thinking on it, even in the Indian ecosystem, this is not happening. Why that, that kind of big resignation that is happening? It's because of the value that organization would like to strive, and there's a mismatch in terms of the expectation that employees have from the owner. Understanding that it's important to have sustainability between employees. And that brings us a little deviating from the earlier question that I gave. A thing that uh, could you throw light on how to deal with the aspect of since you all in the HR and you look at the talent in the hiring, what are the skills that you are really looking for when these uh, graduates come to you? What are the skills that you are thinking or wanting them to imbibe and to have so that they'll be able to sustain their career in organizations like yours? So, Maybe if we can have that as one of the questions, then it's fine. Want to take that? So, um, I think in the last two years, when we were highly hiring people virtually, when I used to see you on screen and you used to see me on screen, uh, what was the thing that we were really trying to ask is one of the important questions that we really ask in terms of how did you make use of this six months of working or studying from home? The lot of us who were doing pretty much a regular thing, you know, we were binging on those web series, Mirzapur Khatam Kar Diya Hamne, we moved down to Mirzapur season 2. Apart from then, there are lot of us who picked up hobbies which are very different, which, which you have not thought about. I hired a girl who were pretty much, you know, tuned to the K-pop trend that is happening. She did not stop there. She went ahead and started reading about K-pop culture as such and she started even studying about the language as such and superior. So you know, we're looking for people who have a passion, no matter where does it exist. But are you really serious about anything in life? So those things talk about it. So curiosity is not a mere word. I was discussing in one of the panel that corporates are looking for, is there a real time tool to assess that? Do you have a passion? Or are you just a herd that you're following everyone around? You know, we all of us wanted to be engineer because everyone else in the class is going to be engineer. Are we, have you taken anything which others are not following? Can you hold on to that argument that you may have? So curiosity, passion, and one of the other things, specifically when the workforce appears to be hybrid in future as well, and the future of work is going to be a hybrid, how high are you on integrity? Is there a value system that you have? Or is just the green going to dictate anything? You know, the throw money and you will get pushed by any organization. Do you have a value? Do you identify with the vision that we exist? So all those things have becoming very much uh, the hiring. And on these basis, there is a make or break decision happening at for an hiring is concerned. So uh, I, I second what you said. Uh, from a hiring perspective, I would say that you know, there's, good, uh, there's a uh, positive side for everything. So the good part of not doing so much of branding so far is that every time we go and approach someone, we you know first try to figure out how much the person knows about us and uh, how you know how closely do they feel about what we are doing. So that's one thing, uh, interest in our company. And of course, uh, we're looking for the right kind of skill set. So that is anyways taken care of. The other thing which we also take care of is learning agility. Uh, because we are a very fast-paced, uh, dynamic organization. So we, we look at people who are willing to learn. We look at people who are proactive. And who you know, will come up with ideas, who, who want to make a difference. because. We are at that stage that uh, we can give you those opportunities. So we, we are looking for people uh, who show these things and at the same time, I think one beautiful part uh, which I uh, really appreciate in my work in the so is, um, so I worked with a lot of uh, brands before this, but I feel that you know people in brands are a little high-headed, <laughs> so, so sorry for <laughs> saying this. But I really feel that, you know, uh, people, it's so easy to connect with people in the company and to work towards one thing. So that's something which I really appreciate in the company. I think uh, 
and that's the DNA of the company by default. You look for such people who are humble, who are easy to work with, and you know where work is the focus, and uh, everything else comes on its own. So let me give you an example, right? Uh, so you see astronauts, right? Uh, they study books and they study everything to do with the system, you know, and then there are stimulators that they continuously operate and practice in for years before they actually step on Mars or moon or wherever, right? And that is the environment that we are in today, you know. So all of you have done a lot of studies in books. You hear us. You know, you tend to practice your projects, but at the end of the day, when you step into a corporate, that's actually like an astronaut stepping on Mars, right? And and therefore, anything that you need to be successful in Mars is what we need for people to be successful in, uh, you know, the corporate world, which is pretty much ability to deal with ambiguity, right? So you think you've learned everything, but then at the end of the day, when you step, you know, your heart starts pounding, right? You fear your life, you know, you do not know whether you'll be successful, right? So the first thing that we are looking at is the way we heard is learning agility, right? Dealing with ambiguity, accepting failure, communicating, right? So if you're actually scared, ask for help. Rather than actually going through the entire cycle, failing, and then not even raising your hand, right? So vulnerability is a leadership trait that all of us are these days trained to practice, right? It's okay to call out and say that, you know what, I've, um, I am not be able to take on the next level for the next six months, but then after six, I'll come back and I'll let you know. You know what, I never stepped on Mars and you know, it really scares me to go there first time. So I think that is paramount. Simple, you know, also is networking. So we are actually also looking at your networking capability because you wouldn't have the answers to everything. But at the end of the day, if you are able to reach out, ask for help, and then translate that into some amount of value for your organization through your ability to innovate as well as engineer and take things to closure in an agile manner, these are the couple of things that you know any organization is looking at to be successful. Three months before the placement starts, so you what you work for. We have been uh, training them on some of these skills, on uh, especially dealing with activity. We have our programs in which we have the problem solving skills, we kind of build it into them, the curriculum itself, so that they are able to deal with these kind of situations. And I think the pandemic helped a lot of people to deal with them. And even now, they are really struggling with how the hybrid models of students also, like sometimes coming back. To, Asking questions like, are we going to have pen and paper test this time? <laughs> so because two years they've been given online exams. So there has been some, I think, um, practicing of this, but uh, yes, that's something I think all organizations are looking for. That if you are more able to deal with ambiguity, accept success, uh, failure. Because we keep on hearing a lot of success stories. It's the failure stories that we don't hear so much. And uh, we really learn from failures, not from successes. Because out of one success, there are so many failures. So we learn from. If we have more of failure stories, in fact, I think the case studies that we do try to write, uh, they are not success stories, they are basically failure stories. But the problem with our, uh, especially the Indian industry, is that they don't like to share their failure stories. So most of the case studies that we find are the ones that have made it to a success. So like, for example, in your case, like, your failure turned it into a success. But how do you do about it? That would be much more uh, interesting to learn. So. Maybe we'll be able to do such things, maybe we'll write in such case studies for the students to so that when they step onto the Mars, it will not be as strange to them as they think it is. Because yes, whatever we teach in class, we cannot replicate the corporate environment. So I recently what? heard, sorry to interject, I recently heard that Google has a graveyard for the ideas that did not see the light of the day. And yeah. the graveyard is pretty huge. And they celebrate those failures that way. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, we only like, uh, I think for every success story there may be thousand failure stories, but we don't hear those. So everybody sometimes get that uh, feeling of, I can't do anything because I can't do that. But what they don't know is that when they succeeded, so many things that they also did, which did not succeed. And that gives them also a little more confidence that, okay, if we do this, 
and that is what we are trying to inculcate with the Vega students have been participating in a lot of competitions, a uh, lot of uh, uh, even uh, business plan competitions where they are trying to generate ideas, ideate and things like that. So that uh, they also experience a lot of failure. So we do hear some of the success stories, but a lot of we know that almost everybody is participating and maybe only about 20 to 30 percent of them are actually achieving something. So, but that uh, brings them that uh, thing that okay, if we, unless we try, we'll never be able to succeed. And that's the first step. So I think that's what we hope that we are trying to build into that. And uh, I think, uh, shall we open them for question answers or if you want to share something else? Yeah. Uh, any questions? If any of you have, because we have three very <coughs> great people in the HR area, then we could be your future. Like, uh, Alvin sir is already a big recruiter for us. <laughs> and we want to have the others. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask the panelists? Uh, you can mention your name and your badge. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, panelists. My name is Simba. And my question is that what sort of encouragement in terms of material or emotional an organization can provide to its employees who are academically not even graduate in terms of improve their lifestyle and business loans? Sorry, can you repeat your question once? Yeah. My question is that what sort of materialistic or non materialistic encouragement a new organization must provide to its employees who are academically not even graduate in terms to improve their lifestyle and business growth. Can I take this question? I think uh, the reason that this question is formed is because there are unequal opportunities in the country. Yeah. Uh, and what we do with those people who are there in those parts of the country where they can't even have access to those education which you have. So they whom do you blame for not doing very well in life? So the, uh, you know, the answer can be uh, given in multiple levels. I think as individuals probably uh, some of you aspire to be entrepreneurs. So this is a very good area from your perspective also to focus on on how you can create opportunities for others and uh, uh, you know there are a lot of career options which are there apart from those uh, glamorous career options which are there so uh, I think it's important to first understand what those career options are for a person who is really looking for the right kind of opportunity and then to uh, pursue that and uh, the maybe the other thing which you can really do is try for something which is cheaper you know if you want to say uh, and I see and I know a lot of people you know who are not employed but they are uh, they are studying with us uh, on our banking platform or on our UPSC platform or on similar platforms and building their skills so it's it's just about wherever you are I'm talking about those people who don't have the money, who probably have the zeal but don't have the reach. So you can also access platforms like these and prepare yourself for a better future. Uh, and primarily that's what we do. Like we are an exam test prep company and we help in preparing for exams like UPSC, banking, railways, defense. We're now also into IITJ, medical, NEET. So, yeah, I think uh, you should just look for the right uh, places from where you can get guidance. Sibar, I don't know why you asked that question because you're pursuing a postgraduate course. <laughs> Is there a reason why you asked that question? I would love to know that because that's a very relevant question that you asked before I try, try and take a take on that. So my the root cause of my question is that because I have been seeing a small entrepreneurial setup in which the uh, workforce is not treated very well. I have seen them work like you know, horses uh, day in a night out and they are not treated well, they are compensated well and that is why the business and the life of their employees are both going down very significantly and after that they blame either their employees or they blame the circumstances for not getting up to the uh, market uh, marks. Awesome. Because I know of a couple of organizations who actually created fortune by hiring people who have flunked class 12. 
and even those who have backlogged in their you know 10th or 12th or even in their grant and they've made fortune out of and what is exactly they're hiring for they're hiring for they're giving them the lifetime of opportunity to make best use of it and as we talk there are a lot of SIs, you know system integrators mass recruiters if those of your engineers they come to you they have started evaluating class 12th graduates because there's a huge attrition with the BTEC and postgraduate guys so what exactly organizations are starting for and I think I'm looking for a future wherein Great Lakes will be having a course on an inst organization one six of you will be studying there and there are 10 organizations who are pursuing asking 10 people to apply there so there's no general education that may happen in future so I think things are changing and you know 2022 batch who recently onboarded us they're struggling big time as you know when you <coughs> mentioned they really do not know how what exactly it looks like to step on the moon and when they started working on coding platforms they really fall fell, fallen flat and even the hiring managers are struggling on a screen while they asked them to do some coding they were doing pretty good but suddenly the struggle is whole new level even the 23 batch wherein IT companies are now going and hiring them some of the companies have to stall because they see a huge rejection rate that is happening so there has been a flip side of this virtual learning that has happened and there's a lot of focus has gone beyond the colleges mind you it is not great place that is a brand that will take you anywhere are you a brand in yourself that is something that will dictate your future do you have it in you to really prove that so i think things are changing as similar asked we are not really looking for postgraduate right thing if there's someone from tier one organizations are really cautious you know whether he or she will stay with us tier 2 and tier 3 as Niti mentioned that's where the talent is coming from do you do you really have the need to make best use of this opportunity IITNs everyone knows they really year, year, every year they mushroom only the entrepreneurs they don't work for anyone anymore so talent has been looked for people are looking for talent everywhere wherever is available but do you have it in you thank you sir I just had one piece to it, right? Uh, which is with organizations heavy focus on analytics, right? We are easily able to figure out what's working for the organization, right? So if you just simply see the postgraduates, then you have graduates from tier one, and then you have graduates from tier two, which are giving A, B, and C salary dates. And then when you look at the performance and their career velocity, which is how soon are they able to go from one level to the other, you know, over a period of time with reasonable data and then analytics on it, you are able to figure out your sourcing strategy. Then, you know, for this role, I'd rather hire a person at this range because at the end, you know, because we're talking sustainability, profitability continues to be king and therefore that becomes very, very important. Right, and then comes your advanced practices and policies. Right, so if you just see the news, I think it was Piggy that allowed for moonlighting because uh, you know maybe the employees weren't earning as well, and there was already a practice. So rather than you know spending your forces to control it, if you really make a policy around it to make it coexist, that's also a potential way to really go through that. And so that's just one piece about that. Thank you so much for the presentation. I would definitely consult and try to implement wherever I can point. Thank you. He's in the first one. Ah, Any other questions? Good afternoon, ma'am. Actually, uh, my question is that during the tough times, how does business sustainability and people sustainability work in synergy? And we have seen this on the line of moonlighting of major IT employees. So, is there any sort of uh, dissatisfaction among the employees that they are going for the moonlighting, uh, choosing the second uh, job, having one uh, major employment there? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I try to answer your question in two parts. One is, uh, you know, the the auditing or the compliance piece, right, uh, which is linked to the ethics, and second is the satisfaction, right. So you can only look at multiple organizations. Even prior to the pandemic starting, they already had systems in place 
that capture people's uh, time on system, right? Which is technically your availability. And if you do spend eight hours, which is very captured by your system, it leaves you very little scope to actually spend another eight elsewhere, right? Uh, so I think organizations have evolved their overall practices in terms of capturing not only the time on system but also the code quality, right? So it's just one thing of like swiping your card and getting into the building. Then the second is time on system, which is bum on seat, right? Are you sitting in front of your system and maybe just clicking? So it's going to capture your eight hours time in front of the system. And then the third is the code quality. So the code that you're producing, were you able to produce that in a shorter distance, which is like shorter uh, length, which is more efficient and effective, right? So a lot of organizations during the pandemic did go through uh, evolution of systemic support to ensure that moonlighting was curtailed. There was more and more uh, reference check and background verification that happened. Multiple organizations did take, because they learned, they used to take a screenshot of the person who was giving the interview and then the person who joined, you know, you would again go back check. So organizations were very quick in adjusting and adapting. You know, the reason why I share these examples with you is all of us have gone through it, right? And all of us learned very quickly in a span of a month, six weeks, to actually make that shift and change, right? So from a compliance perspective, there is a heavy focus on ethics. There's a huge amount of focus as far as background verification is concerned. So that this is curtailed wherever it can, with systemic inputs required and put in place so that, you know, time is being captured. Now, as far as employee satisfaction is concerned, right? Certainly, if you really look at the pandemic, we did see a, you know, the great resignation as we really call it, right? And we also hear that the great resignation was pretty much a great reset because people were bored, right? People were bored of doing the same thing, you know, people were bored without actually going and learning in a network, physical environment. And therefore, employee satisfaction to some extent did take a hit, but a lot of organizations also infused internal growth paths, right? They also introduced learning paths for each role and then targeted it with capturing progress through, right? The organization also went and ensured that there was a given percentage given for internal mobility. So it's more like build talent rather than buy talent. And when you culturally change that and you communicate it enough to say that ours is an organization that rather build talent than buy talent, the surety or the confidence that employees started to, you know, have, feel and demonstrate towards the organization was higher. Similarly with change in role that also had a comp uptake. And uh, let me give you a simple example, right? For a large scale organization of 10,000, you know, like a scale that I come from, at any given point in time, there are 400 open, 500 open roles in the organization as a standard. Because there's iteration, there is new role, there is new business, right? So for those 400 roles, if you allow people to, on a continuous basis, get trained and apply for one level up and tell them, you know, our priority is to fill these positions in-house rather than going out, you actually do create, without any cost impact, 400 additional promotions in the year. That and therefore, while employee satisfaction is a constant aspect because there are multiple factors resulting to employee satisfaction or dissatisfaction. The organizations are focusing on, you know, curtailing different aspects which obviously, you know, are tailored to the given organization need. And what I just shared with you was one example. Uh, I would say that uh, like we are a 1200 uh, uh, strong company, 1200 people strong company right now. Uh, but it's it's a startup, and you do see those uh, difficult times. And uh, I would say before 2020, the time was not very, you know, it wasn't as well as it is today for us. Uh, pandemic hit us, and. Uh, uh, we have to tell some people that uh, you know we might not be able to continue with you, and uh, like being a people-centric organization, that's a little difficult thing to do. Uh, however, uh, you know every company, I would say, has its phases, and when uh, we uh, got uh, ahead with a better time, we have hired most of them back. 
So uh, those are the realities which are there. But I would say that the fundamentals still remain the same, uh, which is to be very people centric. And we have a very young workforce, which means that whatever they need, we try to cater to it. If it means that you need to have a lot of parties in your organization, then that is what we need. If if it means that you need to have a workplace which supports the kind of lifestyle uh, which they aspire for, then we have created a workplace which supports their kind of uh, aspirations. And uh, the other thing which is, uh, you know, which is the good part is that being a product company, uh, we have our own product. So uh, we work on, uh, you know, technologies such as Android and uh, Java and Flutter and uh, like some of the most progressive technologies that we have. So people are by default, uh, you know, attracted by the kind of work that we are doing. So that uh, helps us solve a lot of our problems. Land the moon in the right way. So you're from the two year course? Yes. Sir. Okay. So I think a lot of emphasis that we have asked our folks that we recently hired, and we do understand the onus is on us when we handhold people, let's say for the 23 batch that we'll be hiring in September and October. We have come up with a course for this three, four months wherein we'll ensure that we will define learning goals and learning journey for each one of them so that they are learning something. What if nothing like that is happening for you, you probably can start, you know, practicing a lot more. If there's an additional course that you can take off when there's a lot of practice that can happen, <laughs> please practice a lot more. Not getting the grades will take you places. I think practice as much as you can. If you're into coding, is there a hands-on coding that you have done? There are a lot of platforms wherein you can do that kind of coding. You know, you've heard about a lot of agencies who really prep students from the first year itself by testing them every year. Use those kind of platforms where you can learn. Is move on to the practical side of it in terms of rather than remaining stuck to the theory part of it. My team. Uh, I would say that uh, with learning there are two things. One is putting your efforts and second is getting the exposure. Um, the generation today is quite lucky to uh, get the second one also uh, a lot if I compare with probably my times. So uh, one, I think uh, learning is always in our control, how much you really want to learn and uh, whether it's for academic uh, books or it's a group discussions or whether if you're staying in the campus, pure learning or it's learning through different courses like you said about them, whatever, like there's so many options now. So I think we should uh, look at the different options which are there, see what really works for us and keep persevering. The first thing which is important is uh, what is what is your area of interest? Uh, and that is a journey to figure that out what is it that you really uh, are looking for. So first we should just keep looking for that thing, keep experimenting and uh, continue learning and then trying to get exposure as well. So there are various ways of getting exposure also. Like of course summer internship is one thing which the college also provides. And otherwise also uh, there are lots of platforms where you can go like for uh, uh, the coders, there are platforms where they can go and code and they are rated on the basis of the coding which they do or there are some live projects which companies do. So being a part of it. So at this point of time, like this is the mantra which I followed for myself. You sh uh, I never focused on uh, getting the best of the packages when I passed out of XLRI Jim Shekhar and I was a gold medalist from XLRI. So, focused on 
one was where I can get maximum learning and that's where I joined Mercer Consulting because I knew that, you know, being a part of Mercer, I, they will train me on things. So, uh, eventually, uh, you will interact on things. So, when such opportunities come to you, na, internship, like uh, my project, I want to ask how much money do Don't ask those questions, focus on learning and focus on getting exposure. and possibly just cover the employer side of it, right? And as we beautifully heard, that go for learning rather than remuneration, because remuneration will follow. Once you have learning and once you put your own brand, you know, then everything else just falls in place, right? And therefore, as an organization, multiple organizations are focusing on being learning organizations, because again, you know, the world has changed, and there is engineering that's required, there's innovation that's required, you know, the you know, on one moon to a different moon on, a, on every two to three year cycle, right? And therefore, organizations also realize in order to be cost viable, we do need to build the base of the building, right? So when you do have, let's say, seven, eight layers, the organizations are looking at de-layering one so that during transformation, the communication from the top to the last associate reaches in a seamless and in a very quick fashion. Similarly, freshers are certainly a part of the core strategy as far as talent is concerned. And therefore, multiple organizations are curating onboarding programs that help you not only understand the organization, that help you understand the department, that help you understand the skills and the product that you're working on, but also helps you understand the culture and the values that will make you successful. Right? And therefore, just like we heard, you know, do see and try to get into organizations that are learning organizations and don't base your judgment on, you know what, this is really going to get me the highest package. And that will create a very strong fundamental base for you to be ultimately successful and agile in life. I think and that's, the, that's the piece. And as Pfizer, we certainly have a very strong onboarding program. We certainly have a time base, you know, stepping up of uh, graduates from one level to the other. So that, you know, we do have a continuity for two years where they have constant growth in skills, knowledge base, as well as compensation. So I think that's the only piece that I have to call. So what I would like to add here is that, as uh, Alan said, that maybe in future we'll be moving on to organization specific. So first one and a half years we do a general management, and then we say, okay, come and recruit from us, and then we say, okay, now you tell us what you want them to learn, so that when you yeah, yeah. go on uh, board, so you have that environment that we have created, so you'll be ready to start working from day one, and that is the time that the organizations will save. I think that's so. So uh, I think we're running out of time, so. Question? Some questions. One last, one last question. Okay. Two, three questions we have. Two, three questions. <laughs> Good afternoon to all the panel members. My name is Ritvik uh, from the PGDM course as well. So, uh, post uh, COVID pandemic era, we have seen that uh, few of the countries, Western countries, are adopting a four week, uh, four day week, uh, like uh, the thing, where the employees have to work for four days. So, uh, will it be implemented in India as well? And will your companies be okay with implementing it? <laughs> <laughs> it's good to talk about it. We're struggling in terms of getting the productivity in this virtual. It's, it's good to talk about it. And you heard about Google's and you know the organizations of those leagues even wanting their employees to come back to the workplace. So I think we're very far from there. But I know. Just one more thing, sorry, does it make an employee more? Uh, as I said, you know, there are a lot of organizations while hiring have started focusing on the integrity part of the you know employee that they are hiring. Are you hiring integrity? Whether will you honor that four day work in terms of giving the productivity of five days or six days? Then probably organization may respond to that. But at this point in time, when there is a lot of organizations struggling with the moonlighting, some are encouraging, as he said, but some most of the organizations struggling with the moonlighting are said. We're very far from it. And there's a good debate happening around it, whether we should really go ahead with it. Yeah. Good to talk about it, but probably in our kind of setup, we're far from it. Okay, so I think last question. 
I think we can take two more questions before we we have time. Good afternoon, panel. I'm Varshika, and I'm sorry for have bringing up such a dark question at the hang end of the meeting part. I mean, for the panel part. Speaking on behalf of a very confused generation who had to spend uh, peak years in a very bizarre and unstable world, like our uh, early twenties. So my question is, um, we wake up to battle with ourselves within ourselves every day. So how hard is it, or is it any different at all, to motivate a generation to work better while we are battling between to be or not to be? Hmm. I think it's a, yeah, I think a great question, right? Um, and I will sum it saying that. Each individual is different, and not only you know the generation that you guys represent, but also our generation. We are equally confused, right? <laughs> and it's absolutely fine for us to be vulnerable and say that you know the things that worked for us two years back do not work for us now, right? And therefore, I think organizations are looking at hyper personalization of everything that we offer, right? Right from the benefits to about learning opportunities to your career paths. to even somebody said like four day work week uh, yeah there is flexibility in terms of you work reduced hours and you get reduced pay have we evolved to you work more hours and get more paid maybe not right so i think hyper personalization is the way forward and lot of organizations right uh, are looking at analytics to really identify personas right and when you actually look at different persona identification these personas help you design your policies it helps you design your career paths it also helps you design your communication and your compensation structuring right and therefore analytics you know advanced analytics data intelligence machine learning these are the things which are absolutely relevant and certain organizations like ours certainly uses it to also predict what type of people will be successful you know from which type of institute who are the people who will potentially be at risk of losing 
And then obviously, when you hyper-personalize, you are able to actually, to some extent, engage further than what we were capable of engaging earlier. <laughs> I think it's a beautiful question. I didn't see the person who is actually answer, asking this. Okay, great. So, uh, I would say, uh, you know, from uh, my personal experience, uh, whenever we look at ourselves, especially when we are young, uh, we think about what is our identity. And we associate our identity with a, with a company where we will go to or with the kind of package that we are earning. I think uh, that's where uh, meditation uh, from Ramakumaris has really helped me because uh, what I, how I now look at things is uh, what is my aim in life? My aim in life is to become a better human being. Now, what that means is acquiring, uh, learning new things every day, uh, knowing that you know how I can change myself before I look at changing anybody else. So uh, the answer is that we should never try to uh, build our identity based on social violations. Because if we are dependent upon anybody else to give a stamp to us, or if you are waiting just for the right circumstance to come and then you will become someone in our lives, then that might happen, that might not happen. Just like it didn't happen in pandemic. So we were all lost and confused. But why do we need to be lost and confused? You are an identity of your own. And every day is a learning. I'm sure like many of you who were there uh, in, in the pandemic learned different skills. Probably not uh, how usually we learn when we are in college. But there must be some different things which you have learned. Like, at least I was, uh, I never used to cook, so I like to cook. Uh, so there are always good things uh, which you will acquire in all the times. And if you go with that belief, then wherever you will go, you will be able to bring that enthusiasm, that energy, and people will glow around you. And that's how you attract success. I don't know why you said it's a dark question to it. it. It's actually pretty much relevant and you are a courageous one to really ask. Probably a lot of us in our head do want to ask that question. I think a lot of organizations, while I have interviewed a lot of uh, you know young folks while hiring, I was taken aback when some of them really came back and said, you know, I went through a depression phase. I was struggling with my identity for a while. But I took charge of it. I think accepting our failure, as she mentioned about the vulnerability as a trait in leadership, more or less, if you can accept that, I think I will give you 100 on 100 on the knowing yourself pretty well. So if any one of you is going through that and you're really struggling with that, open up, talk about it. You know, then you have better answers to figure out around yourself. Good that you brought it up. Good afternoon, my name is Piyush and my question is, uh, uh, in your opinion, how did uh, artificial intelligence impact the employees and what role does it play in sustainability in business? I attend that. So I think a lot is being talked about AI and among the generation like you, it's a buzzword and there's a lot happening about it, but it's a very nascent state. Artificial intelligence, as we talk about it, is a lot being used in the hiring state. Uh, you know, you've heard about that employers are going and also going to your Facebook pages and Insta posts and things like that to check on integrity and other aspects. There are a lot of cues that are being taken from that as well. And I, as I spoke of, as I speak about it, there are bots being deployed to read the minds of the employees. And HR cannot be at every place, specifically in the hybrid mode. So there are bots who are actually interacting on day-to-day -day basis, trying to see the mood in the organization. And if you respond to a question, it may take the thread further and ask you then. And by the end of the week, I will get to know the highly disengaged folks in the organization and the, you know, somewhere medium engaged folks. So it's been deployed at a various level to read through minds. How you surf internet, how you use internet, things like that, any which way is happening. But in the employee space also, just to get where, where you are, as I said, employee well-being as a platform we are about to introduce in our organization, in things like that also we get a lot of data about how you're doing that. I'll just 
add to it, which is, uh, you know, advanced analytics is great, but it works when your environment stays stable, right? Uh, because data learns from data, you know, so if you are capturing, let's say, predictive attrition analysis, right, you want to figure out that out of a, your organization of 500, who are the top 10 people that will leave, like your decide, right? the top 10% people that will leave or have the highest potential of leaving. Now, if the environment remains constant, that data, you know, does make sense. But if your environment continues to change, so as soon as you acquire the next organization, your environment has changed, right? And therefore, advanced analytics is directional, but there is nothing that beats the human touch and the understanding of, you know, uh, your own team. So that's the starting point. Second is a lot of global organizations don't necessarily encourage capture of employee data without their consent. So organizations like mine, you know, would actually reach out and say that, you know, we want to use this data. So here, Nita, we want to use data uh, for doing exit analysis. And I have to consent. And if I say no, I don't, then you can't use my data. Right? And therefore, there is compliance angle to it. While these things do give you directional input, a lot of organizations, because of compliance and creating the employer brand, right? because we also want our people to operate freely. Uh, and we want people to bring in their whole selves to work. Right? So there's a senior vice president who is uh, doing engineering in our organization and is in product innovation. But does movie reviews over Saturday, Sundays, we won't judge, right? Because that's possibly he's bringing his whole self to work. And that's where diversity, you know, and inclusion comes into play. And evolved organizations would directionally use data, but may not really look at deciles and, you know, person by person stack ranking uh, and stuff like that. So this is directional, but may not be very restrictive. Uh, Thank God you asked. I was like watching out for you. When do you get your chance to ask the question? <laughs> so I am Payal. So my question is like uh, after post pandemic, we we have seen that uh, people are more comfortable with the uh, people are more comfortable with the cocoon of work from home. So uh, like now they defer going uh, working offline. So how to deal with uh, that mental set? Uh, and even this happened with students as well. Like. They are more comfortable, like, no, I don't want to go to school now, I don't want to go to college, exams are gone. So, how to deal with that mindset? So, I think what really worked for us at NewGen is we have branded the workplace like a whole new thing. Work can happen from anywhere, but now please join us in office to have fun. You know, we'll party together, we'll probably have a beer together, and we'll do a lot of recreational activities. We'll have a Newton Got Talent kind of things. So a lot of fun activities happening, and we would like you to please join back. So those of the folk who are apprehensive of whether, whether I'll be comfortable going to the physical workplace have started opening up. And when they started interacting with their fellow colleagues, I think they felt more comfortable coming back to work. And I know it's a habit which has been developed in the last two years. Earlier, we were pretty much gung-ho for going to physical workplaces and physical study places. But that really worked for us, and we're very happy to say a lot of people. Last evening also, we celebrated Teacher's Day. We're doing some activity around that. So good, and every participant, every event, we see the participation increasing. And even for parties, people, you know, will come for a, just a, a bottle of a beer from Meerut and any place, just for that. Otherwise, he's working from home. So it works. <laughs> I would say that uh, that's a reality. Uh, there is a kind of a constraint which we have in our mind because we have already got used to one way of doing it. So, uh, and of course, from an employer perspective, the employer would want you to be there. Um, so, uh, and uh, I'll tell you the reason why also because, uh, see, for a company like us, we bank on our culture. So, uh, when it is about building a culture, I think, you know, meeting people, you know, bonding with your colleagues, the culture part uh, uh, really comes out even stronger. So, uh, it's it's actually for us, it's it's a step-by-step -step process. And uh, while we focus a lot on employee wellness, we also started focusing on workplace wellness, uh, where we are building that kind of an infrastructure.
structure where you know employees they get interested to come and uh, spend their times and we haven't really uh, made anything mandatory <laughs> so far. So employees can come uh, like this is specially targeted for the tech and product team, uh, while the rest of our organization does come to the office. So uh, we haven't really made it mandatory for them so far, but we do have a lot of events and uh, you know, infrastructure and all that created in the organization so that they do feel the need to come and connect themselves. I'll just add to this, you know, so as far as large skills organizations are concerned, they actually look at three pieces, right? One is they look at data. Second is they try to explain the why. And then third is they ensure that people continue to uh, not get into a knee jerk change, but it's a subtle, you know, moving into where they are moving into. So if you just look at the first piece, which is data, and again, if you are looking at attrition analysis, which each organization does, uh, we have realized that the infant attrition, that you know, people with zero to one year of experience within the organization, you know, that has increased since the last, let's say, five years back, right? So if you really see a trending, you know, the last two years have seen a higher, higher infant attrition, and that tells you that maybe people don't relate to the purpose of the organization, they don't relate to the culture of the organization, and they don't relate to the value that they bring in as far as the organization is concerned, right? So that's data. So if data tells you this, then there is like a data-driven, you know, input that any organization would operate and execute. The second is the why. And the why is absolutely based upon the organizational life cycle. So if yours is an organization that has gone through a reasonable transformation during the pandemic, gone, done a couple of, uh, you know, segments spin-off, gone, acquired a couple of smaller organizations to up your value chain, then in that case, at the end of the day, you do have employees of, let's say, five organizations confused and not knowing what your organizational culture is, what the purpose is, what you stand for, how do you operate. And therefore, there may be a little amount of formality that's really required in order to bring people back in and expect them to work in a manner that's going to set up the organization for success. Ultimately, the third one is flexibility. So we've not taken away the flexibility and we've said, you know what, you know your roles best and you as a leader are accountable for the success of your team and accountable for the attrition and engagement of your team and therefore go ahead and design your own model of working. So if you are in finance and your key you know, time for the month is a month end, then you may decide that for the last 10 days of the month, everyone will be in office because it helps you collaborate and you know, get work done. But let's say if you are in HR, then you have to be in office every single day. But does it really matter if each one of us is in office every single day, maybe I can come Monday, Tuesday, he can overlap Tuesday, Wednesday, and then, you know, there is like an overlap, so on and so forth. So that this HR presence, but at the same time, there is flexibility given as well, right? So I think organizations have gone ahead and given high level of autonomy to the leaders to formalize a flexible work schedule that works best for their given vertical, given the organizational life cycle that the organization is in. And I think that's really worked uh, as far as explaining to people why is it important. And in certain cases, if you are the astronaut that can survive in mass without actually having all the people turn up in mass, then you could actually be allowed perpetual work from home. So I think you know, organizations have looked at role-based as well as uh, team-based models to see if things are successful. Questions because we are out of time. It was such an amazing and insightful discussion. Someone is sitting in the shade of a tree today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. With this note, I would request Dr. Kirti to kindly penetrate the monitor and the dignitaries.
good picture. Thank you so much. I would now request Dr. Jimmy Martin to officially close the panel discussion. Thank you so much.